This is uh, programming for power users. Uh, my name's Chad Adams. And um, quickly, I work at Skeleton Key. Um, we are a platinum level member of the FBA I'm based in St. Louis. Uh, I do a lot for them. I'm a senior developer. We do training. I do some sales stuff and some tech lead type things. Um, I'm certified in lots of versions of FileMaker, but you'll notice that I'm not certified in all of them. So it'd be really nice if I could say like certified in 7 through 16. But for whatever reason, I didn't uh, bother to take the test back in, on 9 there, so I'm, I'm missing that. Um, I want to clarify that uh, this session is titled Programming for Power Users, and that's, that's a little bit confusing, I think, because when I first heard that, I thought, well, that's kind of like, you know, PHP for dummies, right? It's like, you know, or JavaScript for dummies, where you're going to simplify JavaScript or something and, and make it available to, to everybody. And so this is not um, teaching a power user how to be a programmer. Instead, this is, as a developer, programming with the power user in mind and trying to use uh, what's built into FileMaker for free to, to let someone who's pretty adept um, use, the, use those things, OK? Um, my plans for the session are to have just a little bit of slides, and then we're going to jump into demo mode for practically everything. Uh, so if we'll got a little bit of slides to, to suffer through, but then the rest should be halfway interesting, we hope. Um, and these are the types of things we're going to be covering. So we're going to talk about toolbar, uh, quick finds, save finds, table view, quick charts, all those types of good things, um, some snapshot link, web viewers, um, find requests, some stuff you guys probably all know about but maybe haven't thought about quite like I'm going to present them, hopefully. Save Excel, multiple windows, and at the very end, we'll do some Go and some Web Direct stuff. Um, at the end of that, we'll do some Q&A if you guys have any questions, and hopefully, um, I'm sure there's a ton of things that I'm forgetting, so I'm looking for audience participation at that, at that point. If there's things that you use to make FileMaker even better and to use the FileMaker user for free, I'd be wonderful to hear that and share it with the group because I'm sure I'm leaving some stuff out. So I, I like to, uh, to try to get the one thing, like if, if you're going to take one takeaway from this session, what could it be? And, and for this session, this is the big idea. Right? The one sentence summary, if you, if you understand this already, you can, you can skip the rest of the session. And that is that um, I want you to buy into the idea and, and use what FileMaker gives you for free to empower your users, enhance your apps, and to increase your customer's ROI. So once again, we're going to try to use what FileMaker gives us for free to make everything better and not reinvent the wheel. Okay. So with that being said, we're going to switch over to demo mode if I can make the switch here easily. And that's the wrong resolution. So you guys can't see that very well. Bear with me a moment. I'm actually going to change that out because I think I'll fight it the whole time if I don't. Better, even better. OK. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the toolbar. And um, how many of you, like me, I'm, I'm going to show you some screenshots of some stuff that I built over the years. And, um, and some of the stuff is you know, 8 or 10 years old or whatnot. But how many of you have built solutions where you're hiding the toolbar, getting rid of that, and, and on some levels recreating that on your own? So, for example, if you notice over here to the corner, I've got nav buttons. I'm telling the user which order I'm on. I've got new, find, delete, print buttons. I recreated toolbar type stuff, right? Um, again, nav buttons over here. Delete, find, that's a new button. All kinds of stuff there. Nav buttons here. Anybody else do this? Is it just me? Print, new, find, same type of thing. And so the argument I want to make is that FileMaker gives you all of that for free, right? And in fact, they give it to you better than what I reproduced there. So if I look at each one of those, those examples I just gave to you, um, you know, counting the buttons and the scripts and all the stuff that goes in behind there, because the new button is probably not just a new button, it's probably doing something else, and it's probably you know, doing a little extra besides just creating a new record. So there's probably five, maybe 10 hours of work into you know, reproducing some of that, that data. And you know, at, at the point in time I was building this, we're probably charging 100 bucks an hour or so for that work. And so let's just say it's 10, 
10 hours of work, $100 an hour, that's $1,000 that a customer paid me to reproduce something that, that FileMaker really kind of gives us for free, right? And so my, my, the preaching I'm doing today is, is to say, don't do that. Don't, you know, don't do that. Use what FileMaker gives you for free because FileMaker does it better than I could anyway. For example, here's my back and forth buttons that, that I reproduced. They give me the nice little indicator here that lets me even jump to a particular record, right? You know, I can go to record 100 by doing that. They've got a nice little slider, which I didn't bother to reproduce in my system. You know, I could have, but you know, they've got a nice little slider there to do things. If I omit a bunch of records here, I got the, the whole how many record count sorted, the nice little graphic, all the stuff FileMaker gives me for free. And so what I'm trying to convince you of today is that when you're showing your systems to your customers, don't, how do I say this right? We, we, we're so used to FileMaker that we look at this and we think, oh, that's FileMaker, that's just how it works, right? But to somebody who's coming from Excel or someone who's coming from some other solution, this is just part of their app that you built for them. And so don't take it for granted that this is just FileMaker and just how it works. Teach them and say, look, look at how your solution works. Look at how you can do this and build value in what FileMaker is giving you for free, right? And we've got show all, new record, all the stuff that's in there. And I've, I've thought about this and I thought, well, why did I do, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Why did I do this? Why did I build these navigation stuff? Why did I build the new find stuff? And oftentimes the reason why I did that was because I needed that new button to do something besides just do a new record, right? I needed to, to do something new and then run a script and do, do other stuff. And so I want to, you know, proclaim or, or, or encourage you to use uh, custom menus in those situations. So custom menus will allow you to take over the new record button and do anything you want to with it. And custom menus will allow you to take over the delete record or any of these buttons up here can be modified through the custom menu uh, tool and make that do whatever you need. So I can use what FileMaker gives me for free, this, this whole area, and I can still customize it and make it better for my users. Okay. Um, and then the other thing that I want to point out that, that I, I've had to learn to start teaching my users about this is that you can customize this thing. So I can customize the toolbar, add all this type of stuff to it, which gives a whole bunch of extra um, stuff to my users for relatively free. So for example, there's a little story that goes with this one. I had a customer ask me once if we could produce something for them that lets them um, send um, an email to customers who had overdue orders, right? And so we start talking through that and we start thinking about how we're going to do that. And um, have you guys, has anybody in, in the room ever used um, FM Spark, you know, that tool? It's like, a, it's like a letter writing tool. It's, it was a product that sold a couple years ago. I forget now how long back. And essentially, you know, there's this whole dynamic of being able to like type out um, an email or a Word document or send mailings to people and merge data into the thing and whatever. And I was kind of thinking along those lines and trying to figure out how I was going to solve this customer's problem. And I had this whole you know, idea of this module I could bolt in where we'd have a, a big global field or something, some big you know, screen where they could type out the, the email they want to send. They could um, you know, have a field picker, like a portal of field names, and they could click on that and it would insert the field name, sort of a merge type of a field you know, stuff. And then uh, a calculation that would substitute the data in. And they could, we could build them this feature that would essentially let them email overdue orders to their customers, right? We got to talking to the person that needed this and stuff, and they're a pretty savvy user. They, they'd used um, Excel and they'd used uh, mail merge and they'd done a lot of stuff like that and they were fairly comfortable with the um, computers and whatnot. They were a power user, okay? And so we got to talking about it and the way we solved their problem, instead of me building this 15 or 20 hour feature for them, is we did this. And that did what they needed to do for that situation. And so if we look at that, that feature, you know, send mail, you know, they, they got this kind of dialogue, dialogue and they're like, well, I can understand this. The, I need to send multiple emails, one for each record in the found set. That makes sense. I want to, I want to email. So they could do a fine for overdue invoices, right? And, uh, you know, who am I going to send this to? Well, I'm going to send it to, and oh, look, FileMaker only shows me by default the, the fields that are on the layout. And that's nice. I could, I could get to more information here as a developer if I wanted to, but for them, you know, it's pretty straightforward. I want to send this to the customer email. That was easy for them to pick out. And the subject was, you know, something simple like a overdue invoice, right? And for the message, you know, we, we, we did a little training for them. We spent 20 minutes on a phone call and a screen share, and we taught them how to do something like literal text, dear 
space, you know, and we would concatenate on something else. So we would teach them about a little bit of concatenation here because again, they're a power user. They're, this is not unfamiliar to them. They'd done mail merging type stuff before, you know, and customer names seemed fairly straightforward. And so we could, we could teach them, you know, something of this nature, even drop in a couple of carriage returns here and I can't talk and type at the same time. So as I type, I get quiet, I apologize for that. So, you know, we could do things and I apologize for earlier for not uh, zooming even further. Um, and that, that, seemed, that seemed straightforward to them. They could do that and um, it worked. And we didn't really build much of anything. I'm not actually going to hit OK on that because that'll open my email client and, and make a lot of uh, uh, email uh, messages. Then I don't really know if these are fake. I mean, they're fake, but I don't know if they're not exactly accurate. And I haven't checked my email since Sunday. And you guys would get all a bunch of that stuff as well. So I'm going to cancel that. But that solved the problem that, we, that customer needed just because they were a power user and they could work in that environment. And here I was thinking about all how I was going to build this cool module for them and stuff. And this did the job. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about is quick finds. Um, if you're like me, you're fairly used to doing a Google search, right? And using a one, you know, searching for whatever you need in, in sort of a Google type of a, of a scenario. So quick find obviously is this uh, field up here and I'm going to change this if you don't mind for a second. There we are. So um, quick finds are, are going to let me have kind of a kind of a Google search for my for my app, if you will. And teaching a user how to do that gives them a lot of power. It gives them a lot of comfort because they're used to Google, they're used to Yahoo, they're used to that type of thing, and they can search for things. So the way quick search works is we search up here in this field, and it search it searches every field on the layout, both fields and merge fields that are on the layout. As a developer, I can control some of that. So if we go to layout mode here, this isn't a, a session on how to use quick find necessarily, but we'll, we'll touch on it briefly. So the little green uh, magnifying glasses are going to tell me about fields that it'll search quickly for, index fields, local fields. The yellow um, over here are telling me that's uh, going to be slower. It's going to be related fields and unstored calculations, things of that nature. So quick find is going to be slow for those. And so as a developer, what I could do is I could come in here and I can turn quick find off for that and choose include field for quick find. I just flip that off so it doesn't whichever ones I don't want them to, to quick find on, I can turn that off. If I decide that I have layouts that I don't want them to do quick find on, I can go to the layout and I can turn quick find off for this whole layout. And then also I want to point out that quick find is a, um, is a scriptable type thing. You can script the quick find. There's a script step for doing quick finds. And we can use custom menus, like I mentioned before, to take over the quick find process. Because one of the things that I want to do for my customers is usually, is, although I want them to be empowered to do um, the things that are built into FileMaker, I also want to kind of hold their hand and make it nice for them. And so if someone's doing a quick find for something and they get one result, I kind of want to drop them into maybe a form view like this. If they get 10 results, I'd be nice if I could drop them into a list view for something so they can see all their results, right? Well, you can make a, a custom menu and take over the quick find process. And so I can run a script that basically performs the quick find process and then checks the found count and goes to the right layout based on what they find. So a little uh, nicety there is that we can take over this. It's not, there's not actually a menu item for doing quick find. Like there's nothing up here. Whenever you talk about custom menus, sometimes people think that you can only take over what's already there. Um, but there are um, other, other areas that you can take over and quick find is one of those. So whenever you're making a custom menu and you, there's one of the specifications you can say to use a, an existing command and quick find is one of those. So, it's kind of nice that you can still control that a little bit. The next thing I want to talk about is saved finds. So um, again, we're talking about power users and building in stuff that they can, they can uh, utilize for, for free. And so saved finds, if you're not familiar with how to do this, we're looking here under the find button. And so um, in my situation here, I've done some finds for a couple different things. And I already have some saved finds here for red items and customers um, net 30 terms. So let's look at what a save find might look like. So if I were to come into find mode and I find all the customers who have net 60 terms and perform my find, I've got 97 records, right? Um, and then if I wanted to make that a save find for my power user, and, and again, I would teach them this process. I wouldn't do this for them. I teach them this process. I would say to save the current find and it would give me a name for that. And I, would, I could name this whatever I wanted to, to name it. And I would recommend that you use a name here that is uh, fairly uh, verbose, you know, fairly uh, 
I'm uh, going to tell the user where it's from. I'll explain that in just a second. So we're going to say something like customer. Actually, let's just leave it net 60. I'll explain why this is a bad idea, but we'll leave it net 60 for now. When you click on the advanced um, button, you get the specify find request. This is the, almost exactly like the dialogue you get in scripts whenever you do a perform script step. It's the exact same thing. So we're fairly familiar with this. If you've done scripting at all and, and built uh, perform find things in scripts, you know, I can get in here and I can edit this and specify the criteria. This is all familiar to, to the scripting process. You know, I can add new, new requests and I can make this as, as complicated or as, as simple as I need to to get them the right find. And we actually don't want to do that. We'll hit OK. So we'll save that as net 60. The problem with um, perform finds or save finds, one of, the, one of the problems with them is that they are not um, contextually aware of where you're running them from. So right now I'm in customers and I'm doing a find for net 60. That makes perfect sense. But if I flip over to orders and I look under the find menu, the net 60 that I saved is still there. Well, the net 60 is doing a find in the customer table for net 60 terms. And so that might work depending on how your graph is set up, but that might not work at all. And so that's why the naming of, of a saved find is kind of important because you could get yourself in a situation where you're doing a really complex find in a really complex graph and it takes a long time to get done. So you know, when you name these customer dash net 30 terms, that's a little more intuitive for a user to say, oh, I should probably be in the customer context before I start running this thing or else it's not going to work. Um, it will do something. I could search for this and get a result, but it's really hard to know what result I'm getting. Like, if you look at the relationship graph on this particular system, it would be pretty straightforward because I'm on orders searching for customers. But what if I was on vendors and I did the same thing? That would be ugly. So the system doesn't know. I could come here and say net 60. It's like, well, I found 17 records. But what, what, what does that really mean? I found 17 vendors who I've bought stuff from that I've got customers that I have sold stuff to that have net six, it's just, yeah, it hurts my head. So that's one gotcha. The last thing I want to mention about um, saved finds is that these are account specific. Um, so my recent finds, you can see I've done a search for net 60 down here, but these items are based on the current user and how they're logged in. So if I were to log in as somebody else, and go look under the saved finds. I don't have any saved finds here. So those are account specific for um, your users. And I say account specific because sometimes people will share accounts. In, a, in, a, in a certain organizations, if you don't have individual accounts, you might have the sales account or the different things. So named accounts are better, but you get the idea. So I'm actually going to I'm going to stay logged in as the power user for some of these. We might go back to admin here in a second. So the next thing we want to talk about and I'm, I'm kind of running through these because I've, I know that I'm going to run out of time if I don't. But at the same time, at any, one of the, any point along the way, if you guys have questions, feel free just to holler those out. We'll, we'll use the mic and, and get those out. And I'll warn you now that I do, I do a lot of presenting, but usually it's, it's training in smaller, like four and five and six people classes that are in St. Louis. And so um, I can tell you now, I will forget to repeat the question. That's, that's one of the things I'm not good at. I always, I always neglect to do that. So uh, you may have to like raise your hands like, can't hear you a couple times before I remember to be like repeating the questions back to you guys. Um, table view is a big one, I think, that people um, don't utilize enough. So table view is useful, especially useful to people who are used to Excel. And, and for a long time, I, I was very hesitant to uh, turn on table view and let my users get into table view because I felt like um, I just didn't have enough control, right? And so the things I want to point out about table view, the things that are nice about table view, is that one, you can create layouts that are designed to be table view layouts. And you can throw those on the, on the screen, you can have navigation to them, and you can have some table view um, for your customers. But one of the things I like to do for, for people who are used to seeing things with Excel um, is to give them a view like customer detail here, and then let them flip over to table view within customer detail and, and see the table view of this um, layout. Because that, for a lot of people, like to some people this is like way overwhelming and I can't see my data, but for some people like this gives them a warm fuzzy and they can, they can feel like they feel comfortable here. And so the things I like to turn on whenever we're using table view, let's go into layout mode here for a second. And of course I can't go into layout mode because I logged in as that other user. Now we're going to go to layout mode. And so when we set up table views, one of the things we can do is set up the properties for table view. And um, it's nice to leave on things like the top navigation, 
header if it makes sense, footer, bottom navigation. And what that'll let you do is it'll let you um, have the buttons you need so your users can come to these layouts and leave these layouts and not get lost. Because what you don't want to have happen is to flip these things off and close this system up and go back to browse mode. And now they've got this, which is still OK. But if I'm not allowing them to navigate through my, my layout selector, then they don't know how to get out of here oftentimes. They're, they're stuck. And we don't want users to get stuck. So I like to leave on the navigation stuff just to give them that uh, sense of knowing where they're at. OK? Um, also, users find it, you know, again, I'm trying to think about some of the stuff I've built in the past. And uh, I actually built one time a solution because someone needed to, to have some customization over how they saw the data. I built a list view. And I built a, a series of, of calculation fields across the the screen and a selector above that where they could choose something from a, a, like a label field that they want to see the first name. And that first column would show first name information. It was a calculation field. And the second column, they could choose address or type or whatever else, you know, uh, terms. And, they, and they, would, they would choose address and they could see the address stuff there. And I, I built them this custom layout so they could organize the data like they wanted to see it. And, and Table View does that for you. Now, granted, I did that before Table View was a thing. But you know, they get features like being able to reorganize this stuff. Because I'm logged in as a full admin, it's going to ask me every time if I want to save this. If they're logged in as a normal user, they won't get that dialog. And so I can rearrange these things. I could choose something here that, hey, this should really be longer so I can see more data so it doesn't get cut off. So I can reorganize you know, the, the width of this stuff. With a little bit of training, I can teach users how to come in here and modify the table view and show other fields. So like I set this up as a developer beforehand and turned off all the the junk that I thought might be confusing, all the related stuff in the portals that was you know, on my detail screen. Um, but they can come in here and they can choose other fields right, and show anything from the, the system that makes sense. So some of that gets kind of deep. But for a power user, with a little bit of training, there's a lot they can do there. Um, I want to point out that as you get into this, so there's a couple, there's two or three times throughout this, this uh, demonstration where I'm going to uh, be encouraging you to, to open up your system some and let the users see it. So for example, when they modify this layout, one of the things they're seeing here is they're seeing related field names. They're seeing you know, the local field names and stuff. And so something that we're kind of a big proponent at, um, for at Skeleton Key is to use natural naming on things. So when you look under the hood in a lot of our systems, you're going to see things like you know, first name, last name, city, state, zip. You're not going to see a lot of Z underscore PK underscore ID something, something else. Because we know that somewhere along the line, we're going to open that up to a user and let them use sort on their own. We're going to teach them how to use the sort button. And if, you, if, if they're going to do something as simple as the sort and click sort up here, they're going to have access to all of your field names. And if that's all programmerish and geekish and it only makes sense to you, that's going to confuse a lot of people. So we try to name things uh, in a way that makes sense to them. So you'll see that you know, several times through the system. The next thing that I want to talk about is quick charts. There's a lot of value that people get from quick charts. So let's talk about what that is. And, and also, I'll say quick charts you know, not just bring value, but they, they, um, they add a little sizzle to the demonstration whenever you get done with the solution and you're, um, you're showing them how it works. So what do I mean by quick charts? I'm going to do this. I always think of quick charts as being best from table view, but I'm going to start with it and do it from form view because I think that that's something that people don't realize you can do. So for example, you know, I'm looking, let's do a command J. So I've got all 573 customer records here. I'm going to right click on the state field and I'm going to do something and say chart by state. So I want to know how many customers I have in each state. Right? And so I'll hit chart by state and FileMaker is going to pop that up for me and that's not very good. We're going to come back. And we're going to sort by state first, which is an important step. And then we're going to chart by state. And that's going to be better. And I'm going to flip those around so we can actually see the labels in there. So I can tell from that that I've got where my customers are at, right? right lots in California, not so much in Wyoming. You know, there's a nice little demonstration of where all my customers are at based on account by state. And what's nice about this is that I didn't have to do anything as a programmer to do this. I can train a user how to do that, right? I can train someone who's a power user how to see their data better. And when you think about it, a lot of users are not um, paying us to build cool apps. They're not paying us to 
um, to develop um, the solution. They, they are, but what they really want is they want to get in and they want to see their data and they want to understand their data and they want to have access to their data, right? That's what they're really after. And so when you give them tools and you open up their eyes to tools about how they can see that data better, that's a wow moment for them. Now, granted, the charting process in FileMaker can be a little clunky and it can be kind of hard to get your head around and it can be easy to screw this up. You know, if I, if I did a pie chart here instead of a column chart, all of a sudden I'm like, well, I don't know what that means. You know, it's hard to understand. Um, but with a little training, there is some value here. And if nothing else, it does give them that wow factor. It's like, oh, you built that? That's something I can use. Especially if they've got the privilege to do something like save as a layout, you know, or print from here. So if someone's got a, a, uh, you know, a request that, um, from their boss to, to produce whatever else, and they can print a chart and add to that, that makes them look like the hero, and that makes us look good too. Okay, um, on that um, save as a layout stuff, there's also options in there to send that as an email. You can, you can attach these and, and communicate that in lots of different ways. The next thing I want to point out and bring up is browse mode subsummaries. And so I almost didn't put this one in because it's not quite built in the interface. It's not quite something you can just turn to and, and use, but I think of it that way um, sometimes. So um, back in the day, whenever a customer would ask for something and, and they wanted to group the data a certain way and they wanted to, to see that, I mean, I would go through this process and I would build them like a report and we would you know, throw a new window up and go into preview mode so I could show them a sub-summary of their data and, and be able to convey that to them. So browse mode lets you have sub-summaries for free, essentially, without having to go to preview mode. So what do I mean by that? Here we are in the orders um, list view. Let's just go into the detail real quick and do a find for let's say all of the open orders. So here's all the open orders. We'll go back to the list view and I'm gonna sort those by order date. And we're gonna see, I get a grouping here for October and the total order amount over there. And then here's a grouping for November and a total order amount there. I can go ahead and do a show all records and do that one more time and get folder stuff and have that summary convey a lot of data to a user that is fairly cool. With a little bit of training with, for them, especially if you're giving them access to um, modify reports or, or modify layouts, which we're, is one of the bullets, we're gonna teach, teach people how to do that. We can come in, I'm gonna duplicate this layout because I don't wanna actually delete it. We're gonna take this body part and remove that altogether. Move these over to the center because reports or layouts don't have to have a body part. We'll change this to be um, a little easier to look at and my screen is a little funky there for some reason. Oh well, we aren't gonna do it that way. We're just gonna manually change the color to white and change these to also be white. And so by doing that, we've given them a sub-summary that shows them month stuff without having totals in the middle. So the point is you can script this, you can build them reports, you can show information on the screen, and oftentimes that's all your customers need. I used to think that when they needed information like this, what they really needed was a printed report, right? But it turns out oftentimes if they can get to the data and they can see it on screen, that's good enough. And browse mode sub-summaries give you a lot of tools for doing that. In fact, I've built several solutions where we use sub-summaries as a, a navigation aid where there's a lot of hierarchy and stuff and we'll show them you know, a couple categories and then we'll, we'll click on something and we'll expand that out because we're just changing the sort. And I'm happy to show you those examples you know, after the session if you're interested in that type of thing. The next thing I wanna talk about is the snapshot link. And so um, this is one of those things I feel like is way underutilized. I know about it and I still underutilize it and don't, don't use it enough. Okay, so what is a snapshot link? Let's go look at that. So here we are again on these orders. We've got 17 found orders. These are all the open orders. Let's click into the detail view here and let's go to say order nine, right? And so I can send this, imagine a scenario where you know, Sally in accounting has a question about this, these orders and uh, she needs to ask Bob in purchasing about them or something of that nature, right? And so in a typical situation, this can be a lot of emails, maybe a phone call, you know, a lot of descriptive about, uh, questions about these things, so on and so forth. And so a snapshot link lets you do something like this, save send records as, snapshot link. I'm gonna go ahead and put this on a question about orders. I'm gonna put it on my desktop. I'm gonna say, um, 
I'm not going to do this because again, I don't want email to pop up, but I can create an email attachment with this so I can send this off to Bob, right? And I'll hit save on that. And so what a snapshot link does, if I just change some things here, I'm going to do a command J, I'm going to go to products. So Bob's working. If you can imagine Bob working on his stuff, he's over in products, he's looking at this, and he gets this email from Sally about the orders, right? And so he opens the attachment, and what happens for Bob is this. He gets a new window, so his old window's not messed up. He doesn't get you know, sucked out of whatever he's doing. He gets a new window labeled the way Sally labeled the file, questions about these orders. He's on order number nine that we were on earlier. It's sorted the same way. I didn't actually have it sorted, but it would have been sorted the same way. And he can jump right to where she was at and ask questions about that. So a snapshot link saves the user's found set, order, layout, tab, all the information about the screen she was on. It's a snapshot of that screen and sends it to somebody else so they can quickly get there. Okay? And if your user does that a lot and you want to sell it to them in a nice way, we can throw it right up here on the toolbar so that your user doesn't have to go file and export and snapshot link. They can just say snapshot link, save, email, send that off to Bob. And they can communicate internally using emails to actually have a found set of records that makes more sense. Okay? Um, I would say that snapshot links are also scriptable. So if you, if you don't want to put that in the toolbar, if you don't want to uh, teach someone how to do the file edit menu and stuff, you know, you can still use that and say, you know, notify Bob about this issue and, and, or send Bob a notification, whatever. And you can totally do that all through the scripting and have that done um, a little more uh, behind the scenes if you so choose. Snapshot links are awesome. You should use those more. Um, the next thing I want to show is web viewers. And, Honestly, you can do a ton with web viewers these days, right? With uh, all the JavaScript stuff you can do with web viewers, and there's the, all of dayback calendar type stuff is in, is in a web viewer. Um, there's, there's amazing things you can do with web viewers. But FileMaker gives you a lot for free, and it builds a lot of ROI for your customers. So what am I talking about there? For example, let's, uh, I'm going to sort these and go to the skeleton key records, I know where that one's at. So this map tab is using a web viewer to show the address of whatever address is on the screen. And um, I didn't have to know anything about any sort of web development to get that to work, because FileMaker gives it to me for free. So the way that works is when I make draw out my web viewer here and I double click that to get into the web viewer setup area, I'm talking about these areas over here. FileMaker gives me a bunch of custom built or not custom built, you know, prepackaged built things that let me use that web viewer in a way that, as a developer, I don't have to know anything about that. And it brings a lot of value to my customers. So for example, I can plug in the customer address, the city state zip for maps in the US, and it builds all this stuff down here. Like technically, when I go in to do web viewer type stuff, I skip over this. I jump into web viewers, I come to specify, and I start hacking out what I need the web viewer to do, or I've already done that in a text editor, and I just copy and paste it in here. But FileMaker gives you a lot of that for free for these types of things. So I can map things and just plug in my addresses. I can map things in Canada and just plug in my addresses. I can map things in the UK and just plug in my addresses. MapQuest. I can put in a tracking number for FedEx and track where my package is at. With no programming on my part, all I have to do is throw a web viewer on there, point this at my tracking number field that's already in my shipping module for my system, and I can see on screen where that thing's at through FedEx's website. I can search Wikipedia. There's all kinds of things you can do that FileMaker gives you for free, which is awesome. The next one is one of my favorite ones. And this is really about training uh, users to use find mode. And so that seems so basic whenever we think about this. And I've got users that have been my users for 10, 15 years. And we spent some time recently and, and did some training on how to do finds in FileMaker. It seems the simplest thing in the world. And it totally blew them away because they, again, they were able to find the data that they wanted to find that seems super hard. My wife is, uh, she works in HR. 
her company, and they needed to, someone asked her for reports and stuff. They need to find all the employees, they got like 800 employees, all the employees that, that you know, have been here 30 years and live in a certain zip code or, or whatever else. And, and she spends 30, 40 minutes writing this SQL, you know, query thing to, to try to go to their database to find that group, and she's just getting names and addresses. And in FileMaker, it's super simple, right, to do Command F and type out what you need and stuff. So we, we forget as developers just how amazing FileMaker is at making searching for data so simple. And a lot of users don't get how that works and just how simple it is. So the things that we do, or I, I want you to do rather, is to spend 30 minutes with your clients doing a in-person or doing a kind of a web, web screen sharing type of thing and teach them about find mode. So do things like this. Let's say I want to search for everybody who has net 30 terms. That's no big deal. I can find that. And then what if I want everybody who also has net 60 terms? So I can do that a couple ways. I can say net 30 terms, new request, net 60 terms. That in and of itself blows a lot of users away. They don't, they don't realize that you can do that, right? But what if I've already done my found set? So that's one way to get, you know, I've got 127 records here. Um, and, we, and we did a search request for, for two things. But we can also do net 30 and find that and then I could go back into find mode and say net 60, and then say extend my found set, and I get the same 127 records. It's just a different way to get to the same thing by extending my found set. And oftentimes, if you think about it, that's a lot more intuitive for a user to do. If, if, uh, if they can find one thing and then extend to something else, and then extend to something else, and then extend to something else, that's a lot easier for them to get their head around than what that might look like if they were, say, doing, you know, I want to find everybody who's got net 30 terms and has, you know, invoices that are overdue, you know, and, you know, their salesperson's name is John, and whatever it is that, that your guys are needing to figure out, that gets complicated really fast. But if they can do each one of those one time and then constrain or extend that found set as need, that, that's something people can get their head around. So some examples of that. If I wanted to do a find for, let's say, net 60 and people who uh, live in California. All right? That makes sense. But what if I want net 60, California, and Missouri? Well, I could do that again, net 60, California, and I could do a new request and do Missouri. That would get the, you know, what I'm looking for. But I could do that a different way. I could say net 60 and California. I got that. So we'll go back to this again and say Missouri. And I can extend that. So now I got the same thing I just did a second ago. Just a different way to get there, right? Or I could say, you know what? I want net 60, but I don't want California. So I would do a new find request and do California. And I would omit the Californias. I would switch over from include to omit to make sure I don't want the Californias in there. So now I've got all the net 60s who are not in California. But there's another way to do that. I could say, let's do a find for all the net 60s and get that done. And then I'll come back and do a find for the Californias and I'll omit that and then I'll just constrain. So the point of all of that is play with this, get really familiar with doing multiple find requests and doing constrain find and extend find requests and then spend 30 minutes and teach your users how to do that because at the end of the day, that's what they want is to be able to get to their data. And when you show them how to do that, they're going to think their system is super powerful. Um, one of the ways that this makes the system really useful for them, once they know how to do finds like that, then all of a sudden the request for reports goes way, way down. Because what happens is customers want, you know, they want first quarter sales numbers, and then they want a report for second quarter sales numbers, and they want a report for the full last year's sales numbers, and they want a report for all the stuff. And really, those are pretty much the same thing. They're just different found sets, right? And so if you can teach someone how to do the search they want to get to this special data set that's the weirdness that, that they need, and then have a print button that gives them all the customers' names and addresses and phone numbers, that gets them, you know, like it's, 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 it's it's a thousand reports in one is what it is. They can search for anything under the sun and then hit print and get that. It's amazing. Um, there's also the operators that I want to point out, the find operators that are super important. And there's three that are my favorites that I think everyone needs to use and use more. So teach your users about searching for empties. So using the equal sign to search for empties. Right? You know, customers need to know how to search for, for empty values. That's important. Customers need to know how to search for duplicate values. 
use the exclamation point to search for duplicate values. So I've got three users in here that all have the same email address. And users need to know how to search for um, empty related values. So what I mean by that? So look here, for, for this person, they've got no invoices, right? And I just showed you that if we did a search for equal sign, that would give me, you know, blanks. I, I see the ones that have no value there. But that doesn't work whenever I do invoices. If I put a blank in here, an empty sign, I'm going to get um, no, ma no records match that request. But I just saw that that was true. Like if I go back to my dupes, this one doesn't have any invoices. And so when you search for the equal sign like that, what that's actually doing, the reason why that doesn't work is because that's actually searching for customers who have an empty invoice number field. Well, in order to be there, that to be empty, it actually has to be a record there for it to be valid. And so what I want to teach you to do is search for the asterisk sign, which is searching for, how do they term it, zero or more characters. It's basically going to tell you if there is, in fact, data there. So searching for asterisk will give you the six customers that do have invoices. And if what you really needed was show me everybody who doesn't have an invoice, if that's what you're really trying to do, then you would just use the asterisk with the omit to find everybody who doesn't have invoices instead. So equal sign for blanks, explanation point for duplicates, asterisks for related data to tell if there's actually related data there or not. Um, and the last thing I want to throw in about fines while we're here is um, whenever it comes to, to doing the fines, so I, I did a search for equal sign and for exclamation point, and that worked fine on the email address. But if I do a search, I'm, I'm going to copy this. So I'm copying this email address. I'm going to do a find for it. I'm going to paste it back in. We know it's there, right? We just saw it on screen, and it's going to tell me it can't find anything. And the reason for that is because when you're searching for anything that has a weird character in it, like the at symbol here, um, it doesn't index that and know that it's there when it's indexed as English. So if I go look at this, if I go to my fields and I look at email and see how this is indexed under storage, that's indexed as English. And so it's not going to recognize that at symbol and let me search for that. It'll do duplicates, it'll do empties, and it'll do that just fine, but it's not going to let me search for that special character. And so if you need that to work, you need to change your default language to Unicode. And once I do that, then if I come in here and I search for this, I can do find, paste that back in, and it's going to find that one just fine. So anytime you have uh, fields with special characters in them, like at, field, you know, at symbols, any sort of, uh, you know, I, I kind of forget what else is there, but even like phone numbers, I think, with parentheses or dashes, I think will throw you off and, and mess things up. And you can change that index into uni, Unicode, and that will work for you. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about is custom reports. And so... Um, again, we're talking about power users, right? So we're talking about people who are fairly savvy with computers, and we're not going to scare them off by showing them some under-the-hood stuff, whatever. And so what I'm in, encouraging you to do is to let customers come in and kind of make their own layouts, really. And so let's talk about how you do that. So first of all, um, in order to allow a customer to, use, to make their own layouts, there's a couple things I want to change in, in security first. So we'll go into security. And for the privilege sets that I have, I've got data entry only copy is, the, is the, the one that my power user is assigned to, right? And so I'm going to edit that. And under layouts, what I want to do is I, want, I don't want them to be able to modify anything that I made. That's, that's scary, right? That's a, that's a support nightmare if they can modify the stuff I made. So I'm going to do a command A here and select everything. And I'm going to say those are view, view only. They can't modify anything that I made, right? But then I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom. I'm going to take this last one, which says any new layout, and I'm going to make that one modifiable. I'll let them change anything that they make themselves. And then in order to allow them to make something themselves, I've got to go up here to the top corner and say allow creation of new layouts. And so what I just did is I locked down everything that I built, but I'm opening it up so my customers can make new layouts on their own and modify those. And so the reason why that's powerful is because that's always scared me to death to let a customer actually modify something like that in the past. But FileMaker does a really nice job of holding their hand through that whole process. So imagine the, the, a customer needing a new report. 
And, and again, we're, we're kind of painting this picture for them. We're not you know, talking about layouts and we're not talking about you know, new interface screens, although we could get into that. Really what we're painting the picture here is we're gonna, we're gonna offer a solution to you. We built it or we're using a platform that allows you to have custom reports at the end of this thing, okay? And that's hugely valuable to people. It really increases the ROI. So we're gonna use a new layout, new, new layout slash report, right, built in. And we're going to you know, teach them a little bit about how they want to show records from, like it's a customer list, let's say, or it's, a, it's an overdue order, overdue invoice. We'll do, we'll do orders. And we'll call it the order report. And this will be a, a printed type report, so we're going to train them that they need to choose the printer, right? And FileMaker's done this great job of holding their hand all through creating this layout in this kind of wizard type of a, a system with little icons and everything that I will tell you right now, I skip past this. I don't do this, right? When I'm, when I'm making a layout, I give it a name and I hit, you know, back of screen, I hit finish and I jump in there and I start making my layout like I want because I'm a developer and that's, that's what I do. But for a power user, they can come in here and they can choose printer, they can choose report, that makes sense. Do we want to include subtotals and grand totals? I can click these on and off and kind of see what my data does in this little icon representation over here. It's like, yeah, I want subtotals. I want grand totals. That makes sense to me. Well, what fields do I want to see? Well, I'm doing a, uh, an order report here. So maybe the order number and date ordered. That makes sense. And I could, with a little bit of training, I could explain to them you know, where their customer data is stored. And I want to put the customer name on here maybe. And go back to orders. And maybe I want to show the order total or something of that nature. Right? It's fairly simple order report. I hit next. And do I want to organize these by category? Well, sure I do. Probably by customer name. I want to group these things by customer and I get this kind of nice little preview of my, my uh, report over there. And do I want to sort these by customer name? That sounds right to me. Um, do I need to have a summary field? Yeah, I need a summary field. But look, there's only one option available. Most users can handle that because they're power users, right? So there's only one summary field I provided for them to, to do this with. So that makes sense, the summary order total. And I've got to add that to the, the subtotals area down here. So a little training to help them get past that. And do I want a grand total? Yeah, it's the same thing. I'm going to use my summary field for that again and add a grand total, make it at the end of the report, make it at the beginning of the report, put it both places. Pretty simple for most users to walk through this little wizard, right? How about my report? What kind of things do I want in the header and the, in the footer? Well, I'm going to put some large text at the top of my report called, uh, you know, custom order report. And maybe at the bottom I want something like, you know, a page number, and on this side I'll put the current date or something like that. I'll hit next. I don't really need a script. I don't know anything about scripts. I'm a power user. That's, that scares me, so I'm just going to say no about that. Um, and hit finish. And FileMaker dumps out for me a report. It's not the prettiest report. It's something that needs tweaked a little bit. It's something that as a developer I'd want to make nicer. But for my user's sake, it gets them where they want to go, and it's customized for them. And they can do that again and again and again. And because they can modify and edit the reports that they built, then they can change this too. And so if they've ever used InDesign or they've ever used Photoshop or they've ever used anything of that nature, they're probably savvy enough to do something like grabbing this field and this label and dragging that over to reorganize this because those labels are on top of each other. That's, that's you know, something that I think most people could get their mind around, right? And go from there and make a custom report for somebody. You could sort this by... Um, customer name, and again, needs a little work to actually be, you know, pretty and nice, but my, my, my presumption is that a power user could take that and make it work. If we go into preview mode, we can even jump down here and see that I'm on page one and the current date, and if I go to the next one, I got page two and the current date, and again, we're teaching users how to, how to get more value out of their system without having to call me and feel like, oh, crap, I'm paying him by the hour to do this. What can I, what can I do my, get done on my own? Right. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is saving as Excel and PDF. So when I think about this feature, um, mostly I'm thinking about preview mode because I can go to preview mode and those items show up in the um, in the window automatically for me. So if I were to go back to that um, report we just did and I were to go to preview mode, save as PDF, save as Excel, show up automatically, right? Which is kind of nice and that makes sense, but that's not how I'm going to use it this time. What I'm going to show instead, let's see if I've got this built like I want to. Nope. Let's go back. Here we go. Um, so imagine here that I want to do file 
um, save send records as Excel. And I'm on the order, order screen here, so just to show that again, I'm on orders. I've got 127 records. And I'm going to save these as Excel. I'll just call it untitled, automatically open, and hit save. That's going to pop open in Excel for me, and it's going to give me the data that was on the screen, which for a power user who's used to using Excel, this feels comfortable, right? They're able to go to their orders, go to their customers, go wherever they need to, and with the click of a button, essentially see this in something that's familiar and, and, and uh, usable by them. But let's look at that slightly differently. And because I'm going to file and save as and stuff is, is a pain, let's put this back up on our, our menu as well. So we're going to play with save as Excel. Um, save as preview works basically the same, but we're going to play with Excel a little bit here because I think a power user is, is someone who He's probably pretty familiar with, with Excel as well. So um, let's do this from the customer detail screen. And I've got um, all my customers here. So I'm going to do a find. And I'm going to do, again, let's just say net 30 terms. Because you know, it's 30 records. It'd be a nice, nice even, even number. So if I do save as Excel from here, it's going to be kind of ugly. I'll tell you that right now. And we're going to do two records being browsed automatically open. And I've got all my related data in here as well. And so it looks like this. It's crazy, right? I get contact information and I get all this you know, weirdness that's not that useful. But this is where the beauty of table view comes back in. If you turn that on to your users, let's come back to FileMaker for a second. And let's switch this back to table view. Yeah, I want to save that. And so they're already used to using this because I, I taught them how to use table view earlier, right? And so if we hit save as Excel now, remember this is the same layout. If we go into layout mode, we're still in our customer detail screen here. But because we're in table view, FileMaker is going to be smart enough, I'll call it untitled three, to only export the fields I'm looking at. And so if you teach them how to use table view and let them reorganize things and move them around and hide all the other junk that's not what they need to see, and then export as Excel, all of a sudden, they're in a world that they're familiar with, and they can now do pivot tables, and they can do charts, and they can do, you know, send this to their colleagues, whatever they need to do. And so my recommendation for you is to teach your users how to use Save as PDF, Save as Excel, because they get a lot of value out of that. And that, at the end of the day, that's what I want my clients to have, is I want to produce something for them that they get a lot of value out of. Okay? Let's go back to FileMaker. Um, this one is, is a little bit of a, a gotcha, can be, but uh, multiple windows. So um, as a developer, this scares me. I don't like having multiple windows open. So we've got three windows here. And um, the, the thing is, you either need to embrace multiple windows or you need to turn them off because customers are going to find them and they're going to use them, right? And so what I mean by that is imagine your own uh, web browsing experience. How many of you use multiple tabs? I'm sure most people have tabs open all the time, right? So users are the same way. If they can do new window, this, this is kind of like having multiple tabs in a browser. It's, it's, it's hard to let go of once you know it's there. And, and customers are going to find it and they're going to do it. And so I was uh, helping one lady um, recently you know, to, to do something. And we'd done a bunch of programming right, to make things easier. And, and she was saying, hey, this isn't working right. Whenever I go from products to orders, it's not showing me what it says. You said it would show the active orders, and that, it doesn't do that. And, I, and I, I troubleshoot it, and I try to I check it. And so sure enough, if you click the button, it shows active orders just like it should. And so we do this screen share. And I'm like, OK, show me how you do this. And I say, go to, go to orders. And she does this. Junk. She, she had multiple windows open. She is switching windows, not using the built-in interface, right? And so there's this disconnect about you know, how the system works. Because I was doing more behind the scenes, behind the navigation as a programmer. I was, I was doing stuff. She had multiple windows open, and she was doing something else. And it didn't work for what we, we thought she was doing. So my recommendation is either embrace that and program in such a way that a user can have multiple windows open and have their orders and their customers and their purchase orders, especially if they've got big displays and, and stuff. They can see all that information at once. They'll love it. On the other hand, you've got to watch out for record locking. It's easy to get in a bad situation. And you've got to watch out for the navigation stuff that we normally do as developers to make things nicer. If you're setting variables or you're navigating and doing finds, if you're, if you're doing things in those navigation buttons, you're going to lose some of that. And so you've got to think about it. So it definitely involves some planning. But multiple windows are something that FileMaker gives us for free. And uh, once more, that's, if you're not familiar with multiple windows, um, all I'm talking about is window command, new window. And there we go. We can now do orders here and jump around the system somewhere else. And I've got this other window in the back. Okay. 
So either embrace it or turn it off. And if you want to turn that off, you go back to custom menus and you turn, use custom menus to turn it off. So it's, it's the third time that we've kind of mentioned custom menus. Once on uh, uh, this, once in, I have to go back and look now, I forget where, where we mentioned that. But custom menus are useful. Uh, toolbar, I guess, and then also quick finds are the other two. Um, this one, FileMaker Go containers. Let's see if I can get this to actually come up. So bear with me for a second here. We're going to try to show my, my uh, iPhone. That's not me. Or, I mean, it is me, but it's not what I wanted to do. There we go. So um, really what I'm trying to, to point out here is that FileMaker gives you a lot for free just in the container field. So there's two things about FileMaker Go that I want to show. And let's just try to make this easier to see by getting rid of everything else. So the first is, just like I said you should use toolbars in FileMaker, same thing goes for Go. If you know anything about you know, app development, you know, there's a lot built in here through the layout selector, through scripts, through printing and exporting, send, save as, even your snapshot link is available here in Go. And there's a lot that FileMaker gives you for free just in the toolbars of Go, right? Um, but one of the things that's really cool is I can click on this um, container field and I can use it to take a picture Right there, you guys are all in my session now. Um, I'm gonna go to the next record so we can do something else here. We can choose an audio file. So I'm recording an audio file, and hopefully I don't sound too bad. I always sound weird when you're recording yourself. If you notice that, so I'll uh, save that as an audio file. And FileMaker is just doing this for me, you know, for free. No real programming on my part. All kinds of neat things I can do here. I can scan a barcode. I don't have a barcode actually to scan. One's provided. Hey, looky there. Um, I'd have to do some programming probably behind the scenes to make that actually put the data into a field like I might want it to. But uh, there's a barcode. Go to the next record. We can capture a signature here. All right? I can uh, go to the next record. We got photos. I can get to my music. I can use files. So any, any files that are stored on my on my device here, I can go to locations and grab things from my iCloud account or from Dropbox or from different places that FileMaker gives me for free. And all this is built in. This is just normal FileMaker Go container field stuff, right? And uh, it's cool. And so the point I want to make with all of that is use what FileMaker gives you for free. And then the last thing before we start and do some Q&A, and I think I'm running over a tad here, I apologize for that. So the last one's WebDirect. And if we go to Safari. I have all my files now password protected on my server so that you can't see my list unless you enter your, your username because earlier I was doing, I was you know, opening FileMaker and going open remote and I saw like you know, 300 servers from the whole session here. I was like, oh, I could get, if, you, if you're running a FileMaker server on your laptop, go make sure that other people aren't logging into it because we all have FileMaker here and we can all see that. So just be aware. So I'm opening the system here. This, this opens up naturally. And so my, my contention is that FileMaker WebDirect gives you a lot for free also. And so again, just kind of Focusing on how they do the toolbar is, is one thing, but I can choose files, I edit, view. Imagine if you're trying to do this same type of a thing all through custom web publishing, how difficult that would be um, and how long it would take you to do that. Um, I'm not actually going to choose any of those necessarily, but I can insert things, I can go to my scripts, I can, uh, you know, I can really do a lot here. I've got the whole, um, let's go to customers for a second, customer detail, I can navigate through these. Um, I've got the same things I had before about you know, the, being able to choose the slider. You know, again, I'm not a web developer at all, but I've got to imagine that this little widget and stuff represents a significant portion of time if I want to produce this for a customer, right? And so being able to, you know, do these things seems to be um, pretty useful to me. And I was... This used to be okay, and as I have some customers needing some web direct type stuff, it amazes me how much that it gives them uh, for free. And if 
we go back to FileMaker. That takes us back to Keynote, which is now somewhere. Let's go here. Keynote. Did I close it? Surely not. There it is. So review. Um, FileMaker gives you a lot for free. Custom menus can really help you enhance the built-in features. And uh, I want you to try to think about ways you can use what FileMaker gives you for free to build value in the eyes of your customers. 